So elements of this problem might be a little monotonous, but let's, uh, let's try to take an integral using Taylor series. Let's go from zero to zero point one e to the x times the sine of x squared dx. Nothing that um Nothing that we know how to do obviously works here. So that's, I mean, just because the final exam isn't that far away, let's recall what sort of things we might want to try. This is a composition. So you might try letting u be the inside function du then would be 2x dx. And if instead of e to the x, we had 2x, we'd be brilliant. But, but what's the use of saying that? We don't have 2x. So the u substitution fails. Other than that, we have a product. And the um, technique we have for products is integration by parts, but that doesn't work for every product. And it's probably not going to work for this one. The sine and the e to the x both interact really badly with integration by parts. If you remember Lyot, these are the worst two choices for um, u substitution. Sorry, for integration by parts. So nothing we have, I think, really works. Let's try using Taylor series. This is going to be a little tedious. I mean, ordinarily, you would not be doing this by hand. But if we can make it work, we'll have really illustrated the power of this technique by finding, or by approximating at least, an integral that we couldn't take using any of the first state weak material. Now, we have options. I mean, I suppose one thing we could do is we could just jump in and start taking derivatives. Because that's what we need for Taylor series, right? We need derivatives. The first derivative and the second derivative and so on until we have enough terms. Um, it might be a little easier, but also more time consuming to do this not to looking at e to the x times the sine of x squared, but looking at the individual components of this function. e to the x is what? I hopefully do not botch this problem in the, the first step by messing up the Taylor series, the McLaurin series, I should say. But this is e to the x. Specifically, this is e to the x around zero. And again, that's something I emphasized at the end of class Thursday. A lot of absences, as I recall. Um, 
This tail of our series needs to be centered near the values we're interested in. So, um, a tail of our series centered at zero is appropriate for this integral because we're just integrating over this small interval near zero. If we wanted to integrate over a large interval, <coughs> the interval from the integral from zero to five, Taylor series would be more difficult. And you'd be thinking, well, maybe instead of Taylor series, I should be looking at the trapezoidal rule or something. But there's e to the x, the sine of x is, and I always have to pause and think, the sine is an odd function, so we start with an odd power, and then We alternate these powers. And I've said that when Taylor series are appropriate, we shouldn't need to, um, well, first of all, that's the sign of x. The Taylor series works naturally with composition. So for the sine of x squared, we just take the x squared and we plug it into x. x squared minus x squared cubed is x to the sixth. x squared to the fifth is x to the tenth. So we can get a Taylor series for the sine of x squared, and we don't have to go through all of the bother of um, taking derivatives one by one. We can do it in this very natural way. Let's see, how do I want to put this on the whiteboard? Let's edit this here. x squared, then we have x to the sixth, and then we have x to the tenth. And these series go on forever. I mean, they're infinite series, but let's try using just the first three terms. Uh, we've seen that, like when we went to Desmos, we looked at all of these graphs, and usually the first three terms were good enough. The first three terms were approximating the function we wanted to integrate. So let's erase that, and let me change my equal sign to squiggly equal, which I'm sure I've used at some point or other, but means that we're doing an approximation. This equality is no longer exact. Um, and I said the first, here I'm keeping three terms. That's even erase a little more. 
Let's keep three non-zero terms from each series. And it would be really, really sad to get to the end of this and then not get the right answer. So let's check our work as we go to the extent that we are able to. So we've got e to the x times the sine of x squared. Oof, what a function. But we're only interested in the value between 0 and point 0.1. So we're interested in this curve, and we want the integral under the curve. And I'm approximating e to the x as 1 plus x plus x squared over 2. And I'm approximating the sine of x squared as x squared minus x to the, my short-term memory, as you've observed, 6 over 3 factors. Plus x to the tenth over five factorial. And again, we're only interested in this on this interval from 0 to point 0.1. And yeah, this is, this is working brilliantly, or at least it should. I mean, here's the function. Here's our approximation of the function. Visually, these things are identical. So the integral of this and the integral of that should be extremely similar. And now all that remains, and I shouldn't say all that remains, because if I'm going to make a mistake, I bet it's here. But what remains is the grunt work of e to the x times the sine of x squared. is about the same as 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial times x squared minus x cubed over, when we're integrating, we're going to need numbers. 2 factorial is 2, 3 factorial is 6. 5 factorial is 5 times 4 is 20, 20 times 3 is 60, 60 times 2 is 120. And let me actually go to Desmos because mathematicians are very lazy, and if I, the, the, the less work I can do, the better. What would happen if I just used two terms? Well, I deleted these last terms, and absolutely nothing seemed to happen. Obviously, we're sort of relying on our ability to 
to just to look at this and see what's going on. But let's let's really focus in on this. Okay. Yeah, I mean, at least to the extent that we're able to see changes, looking at them on Desmos, we don't even need this x to the 10th term. I keep deleting it and then putting it back in and the graph isn't changing at all. So let's just delete it. What about this? Well, again, it really look, I guess I, I'm, what am I doing? I was saying, oh, I'm seeing a difference, but that was because I was doing complete nonsense. Here's without that, here's with it, without it. with it. I think I'm, I think I can detect a difference. Let's keep this x squared term, but get rid of the x to the 10th term. So now the monotonous part, we have to uh, multiply these out. So let's try to just do this one by one. One times x squared. one times negative x cubed over, not cubed, x to the sixth over six, is that right? Yup, six up here, three factorial is three times two times six. It's just a coincidence that the powers are the same. So that's one times those. x times x squared is x cubed. x times this negative um, x to the 6 over 6. Negative x to the 7 over 6. Then x squared over 2 times x squared is x to the 4th over 2. And x squared over 2 times negative x to the 6th over 6. Let me see. We add the powers, so minus x to the 8, and we multiply the denominators, so we've got a 12. This look good to everyone. As I say, more than the calculus, I feel like this is where some, if something went wrong, it would go wrong here, just missing a negative sign or something. But if this is correct, we can take this integral. I mean, it's going to be tedious. Now, it will be tedious in the sense that we've got to take the antiderivative, but taking the antiderivative isn't hard. 
all of these terms we just deal with one by one, one third x cubed minus x to the seventh over 42 plus one fourth x to the fourth minus x to the eight over 48. A math PhD and I still take three seconds or whatever to multiply eight and six. x to the fifth over 10. x to the nine over, one hundred eight. And we are plugging in the limits of integration and the good news is that one of the limits of integration uh, just, I mean, we plug zero in, we get to zero. So it's only the 0 0.1 that we have to worry about. Let me, if anyone's watching this recording after the fact, this is going to be kind of tedious. I mean, it's kind of tedious in the room, but I don't want to constantly be going back and forth between the whiteboard and the camera. So I'm just one third times 0.1 raised to the third power minus 0.1 to the seventh divided by 42 plus 1 fourth times 0.1 raised to the fourth. minus 0.1 to the eighth over 48, plus 0.1 to the fifth over 10, 0.1 to the fifth, over 10 minus 0 0.1 to the ninth over 108. So negative 0 0.003 wait negative better not be negative it's not i was looking at this negative uh sign point zero zero three five nine three three And let's check our work, if this approximation is any good. Let's go to the 
a computer algebra system. There's one online for free, Wolfram Alpha. Integral from 0 to 0 0.1 of e to the x times the sine of x squared. Point zero 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 three five nine three. Three five nine three, and I think we disagree on the next decimal. Yeah, on Wolfram Alpha, the next decimal is uh, five. In our calculation, it's three. But this is, I mean, accurate to six decimal places, which is not bad at all. And going back to what I've been trying to sort of hammer home, I mean, theoretically, we're using these infinite series, which sounds like it should be difficult. But in practice, to get six decimal places of accuracy, we used a polynomial with three terms and a polynomial with two terms. We didn't have to keep many terms at all for this Taylor series to do what we wanted it to do. <clears throat> so that's Taylor series. We spent, I mean, we're not done with it, as a matter of fact, but sort of, I think the main application of Taylor series is usually an integration. So that's, you know, the main, in, um, the main thrust of this material. We obviously spent quite a while here all of last week, and now um, at least part of today, but that's fine. I mean, in many ways, in many ways, this is kind of the climax of the class, although, I mean, it's probably hard for you to be excited about it, but it's the moment in the class where the first semester material and the second semester material come first eight-week material, second eight-week material come together and give you this very powerful tool. Talking as if the class is over, but we have 20 minutes left, so we can look at something else um, still related to Taylor series. Does anybody have any questions about the first half of this class? And here's a here's a piece of material that's going to look unimportant, and we're going, um, we're not going to be able in Math 252 to explain its importance, but it actually is very important, and if any of you want to take differential equations, um, I doubt it's in your major, but I'd love to have you. We'll use this a lot in that class. And it's trying to look at the exponential of an imaginary number. So before we go any further, let's make sure we have that background. I 
is the number such that i squared equals negative one. So there are no real numbers with that property. Any real number squared is positive. I is called the imaginary unit. So the imaginary unit squared equals negative one. And we want to know what happens if we perform exponentiation with this. And as I say, we can't really justify um, the importance of this, but I will just, I will say outright, I mean, this shows up in very concrete settings where you would not expect imaginary numbers to show up. Like, there's a very famous ecology model, the Lotka Volterra predator prey model, where we have a prey species and a predator species, and we're trying to figure out what will happen as time passes to these different species. And analyzing that model, you end up using an expression that looks just like this, e to the imaginary unit times, well, times t in that model, but e to the imaginary unit times a variable. So it is something that shows up in, in applications, and we're going to deal with it using Taylor series. I mean, the basic idea we have here, right? We know the Taylor series of the sine. If we want to know the Taylor series of the sine of x squared, we just take that x squared and we plug it in. We know the Taylor series of e to the x. Uh, he says before complete the botching, the Taylor series of e to the x. I'm thinking of the sign here. We're not alternating terms. We've got them all. So first, second, third, then x to the fourth over four factorial x to the fifth over 5 factorial, and so on. So if we want to look at e to the i theta, it's 1 plus i theta, let me make sure these are clearly separated, plus i theta squared over 2 factorial plus, and before I keep writing, all of these are going to be simplified in the same way. I theta squared is I squared theta squared. Then it will be I cubed theta cubed. Then it will be i to the fourth, theta to the fourth, and so on. So, 
So, uh, that doesn't look very nice. But presumably these powers of I are things we can take, right? Like, we see this I squared here, and we know what I squared is. I squared is negative 1. So we can go back here. This I squared will turn into negative 1. And then adding a negative is the same as subtraction. So, we were able to, um, able to simplify that. And that's, this is probably not, uh, recommended, but I'm going to just, well, first of all, I'm going to scribble a bunch of stuff out. We're done with the, this. It's in your notes. It's earlier in the recording, if you're watching later, let's try not to be distracted by it. What about I cubed? Again, this is, we're done with that. Well, I squared is negative one. So I cubed is negative 1 times I, which is negative I. So let's go back here, and that positive I cubed is the same as negative I. What about I to the fourth? Well, if I cubed is negative I, I to the fourth is negative I times I. Negative I squared. I squared is negative 1. So I to the fourth is positive 1. What about I to the fifth? Well, I to the fourth is positive one. So I to the fifth is one times I is the imaginary unit I. So these imaginary units are simplifying. All of these expressions are i to the fifth is just i. i to the sixth well is i times i. It's i to the fifth times i. So it's negative one. So what are we getting here? Well, we're getting some terms that have an imaginary unit in them, and we're getting some terms that don't, right? So as far as the imaginary unit, 
it's there, and it's there, and it's there, and i to the seventh, and i to the ninth, the seven factorial and the nine factorial, every other term has an imaginary unit. And conversely, no imaginary unit, no imaginary unit, no imaginary unit, no imaginary unit. Every other term has the imaginary unit in it. Let's look, let's clear this. And let's look at the terms that don't have the imaginary unit i in them. Well, there's a 1, and then there's a minus theta squared over 2 factorial, and there's a plus theta to the 4th over 4 factorial, and there's a minus theta to the sixth over six factorial. And this is hopefully looking familiar to you. We are, uh, well, this then keeps going forever. So, this alternating series that only has the even terms over the even factorials. This is a Taylor series we've seen before. It's what? Cosine is correct. Thank you. So when you take all of these terms that don't have an I in it, and you put them together, you're going to wind up with the cosine of theta. Now, let's look at the terms that do have an imaginary unit. Well, there's the I theta, And then there's an i uh, theta cubed over 3 factorial. Notice that we've got the i factored out here. And then there's a theta to the fifth over a 5 factorial. And a theta to the seventh over the 7 factorial. And just like the terms without i's gave us a trig function, the terms without i's gave us the cosine. The expressions with i give us a familiar Taylor series as well. We're getting the odd powers over the odd factorials we wind up getting the um, sign. And we have this imaginary unit out in the front. So this is, this is Euler's formula. It's difficult to choose. I mean, we have so many mathematics seems to be a, a discipline of prodigies where people just revolutionize stuff. You know, there's Newton and Leibniz and all of those great names. I would say that 
in a very crowded field. The mathematician Vianard Ulwaver has a, uh, a very strong case for being the greatest mathematician ever born. And this formula bears his name. That e to the i theta is the cosine of theta, thus i times the sine of theta. And this is, I mean, this is totally unexpected, or at least it should be if you think about it. Like, when we think exponential growth, we probably think very fast growth. And that's true in the real numbers, but in the complex plane with that imaginary unit, e to the i theta is actually a periodic because the cosine is periodic and the sine is periodic. So if you try to imagine the graph of this, it's some kind of periodic thing. It's sort of spiraling, which is certainly not what our intuition from the real numbers suggests that the exponential should be doing. Uh, this is sort of a bit of, I think of it as a bit of trivia. I'm not as sold on this being interesting as some people are, but if we put the number pi in here, the cosine of pi is 1 and the sine of pi is 0. And You can then rewrite this as e to the i pi minus 1 equals 0. And this is also named after Euler. It's called his identity instead of his formula. And I mean, I do, I did, I did a lot of pure mathematics. I do like pure mathematics. At the end of the day, I'm a, an applied mathematician. I did my PhD looking at a yeast model. So I'm not always as sold by these kind of because this isn't, this doesn't have applications. This is sort of a pure mathematical statement. This has applications. I'm, this is important. This really doesn't. But people like it because it does bring together the five most important re, uh, numbers in mathematics. Um, the constant e, the constant pi, the imaginary unit, the multiplicative inverse 1, and the additive inverse 0. Those are the most important numbers in math. And if you look at the way they're defined, like i is the square root of negative 1, and pi is a ratio involving a circle, and e is some limit you get from looking at compound interest, there's really no obvious reason these numbers should be related in any way. So it is quite interesting. I mean, even I think it's quite interesting that we do have this identity and that they are related like this. That brings us neatly to the end of the uh, end of class. I think it brings us to the end of the section as well. I think we'll start looking at parametric stuff tomorrow. So, test Thursday, I've said that, and now I'll say it again. Uh, 
sequences and series, so finding a radius of convergence, finding Taylor series. There will have to be something on the various tests, like use the integral test to determine if something converges or not. It will all be very similar to the homework you've been doing, which the homework's been good, so I'm not too worried.